Good evening, welcome. Uh, last year, just before uh, Christmas, uh, when I was going through uh, bookshops um, in America, um, one would see this book, uh, What is Architecture? An essay on landscape buildings and machines by Paul Shepard everywhere. It was really one of the uh, hits uh, uh, just before Christmas uh, last year. And uh, I would like to just quote a very tiny passage from this book to give you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but to just give you a sense of the way in which Paul, in a way, uh, combines the relationship between architecture, landscape, and the actual craft of writing itself. He says, when archaeologists started looking at the Greek temple precincts, they could not make out at first what principles of planning governed the relationships between buildings. They seemed haphazard and unaligned. It was not until the archaeologists unraveled the myths and how the stories of creation were thought to inhabit the landscape that they realized what was done. The buildings were placed in a landscape vigorous with meaning. They were set down, not in relation to each other, but into this and I hesitate to savor the phrase, discharged void. The people who discovered this say it like this, charged void, in three syllables to lend it some mystery. We are very pleased at the AA that Paul has agreed this uh, term to participate in two different kinds of events. One is a seminar, which is called Cultivated Wilderness, uh, which he's going to start in mid-February. I think Feb Wednesday, February 14th is the first of these seminars, which is based on his new book, which is going to be published uh, by MIT Press sometime next year. And the second, uh, which is really related to the talk that he's giving tonight, is uh, a new project that he's starting under the title M, which is his uh, alternative uh, millennium. And I'm sure that he will explain more about that during the course of the lecture. As you probably also know, uh, Paul uh, is a graduate of the school uh, of the AA. He studied here uh, between 1967 and 1972 and was a tutor with uh, Mike Gold, who is here in the, in the audience, and Jean Sillett and a number of uh, others. And uh, I'm really uh, pleased that uh, he has agreed to be once again part of the school. Would you please join me in welcoming Paul Shepard? Right, now is this um, turned on, this microphone? Can you hear me in the back when I talk like that? Yeah? Um, this um, M project is, uh, M stands for the millennium. M is Roman for a thousand years. And I must say that when I've been telling people, well, what are you talking about, M? I say it's a millennium project, and people go, oh, not another millennium project. Not another bloody millennium project. Can you still hear me? Um, and it has been overdone a bit, hasn't it? But it's really, uh, the problem of it, I think, is entirely that it's connected with the uh, grabbing for cash. And it's become associated with the lottery. And uh, the lottery is a is is not amusing because it's a sort of cave into fate. You know, there's there's nothing we can do about the world. Okay, there's nothing we can't equalize anything in the world. It's all down to chance. It depends who your father was, after all. And uh, this has contaminated all the thinking about the turning of the century, because there is the turning of the century to do as well as the turning of the um, millennium. Both. Dates are arbitrary. That's another difficult thing about millennium. It's somebody who was working on that big Doncaster thing, uh, you know, the, the um, Earth Center, say, was talking to me about it the other day. And he said, you know, it's all, uh, Jesus was actually born four years before. Millennium should turn in 96, this year. And he said, what's more, you know, the millennium doesn't actually start till 2001. That old chestnut. So I reminded him when babies are born, they are naught. 
And it's the first, when a baby is one, it's an anniversary of 12 months having been achieved. This is why people say the baby is six months old. Um, so that was cleared up. That's arbitrary. <laughs> the other thing that's arbitrary is um, I, what I'm doing is I'm looking at buildings that have been designed between naught and 2000. That's between M and MM. And uh, it's quite a difficult thing to do because it's such a long time and there are so many buildings. An enormous quantity of them being built in the 20th century. Uh, but it is a sort of history project, this. It is related to time because of that. Um, the other arbitrary thing about it is to have this time frame and also to have a place frame, which is for the purposes of starting off this project, England. Um, history first, though. I, I was at a dinner table with Andrew Saint the other day. And he said at one point, my friend has made a table out of a piece of 8 by 4 chipboard, which is really huge. And it doesn't make a good dining table because the other people are just too far away. You can hardly hear what they say. But this thing that he said drifted across. You know, there was no conception of space before the 19th century. And I found this hard to believe. If there was no space, how would you know where anything was? And uh, th this struck me as being the sort of thing that historians say, really, and quite a good reason to get involved in the history project. But it was still interesting because... Um, if you had to get from one place to another, you would, you would have to have some idea of space, I thought. If you had to get from Droitwich to Worcester, say, which is uh, seven or eight miles like that, you would, and you didn't have a conception of space, you'd have to, you might have one of direction, I suppose, to think where Worcester was, because you were going there. And you'd set off in this direction through this non-space, and after eight miles, um, a couple of hours, you would arrive in in Worcester, and Worcester wouldn't have been in space so much as in the future. But you would have been travelling through nothing in particular, and in the future you would get you would be in Worcester. And I think that's that may be what he meant, that there was no conception of space and things were all just in the world. And sometimes you were here and at other times in the future you would be somewhere else. It's quite an appealing thought, isn't it? And naturally, I started thinking, well, you know, um, before some date, imaginary, there was no conception of time. Well, perhaps I could do that, no conception of time. There is no past. There is no future. Difficult to say there is no present, because that's exactly what there is. It's all present. There is no past, though, and there is no future, is there? I mean, there are things which have been made in the past, like this thing and this building, but they're here now as well, with us in the present. The fact that they were made in the past is somehow not germane to their existence now. And all the, all the evidence of things that were done in the past exists with us here now. That's why we know about it. And as for the future, well, that's a bit easier to understand, isn't it? That you, you, you all know, unless you get really fed up, that in five minutes' time you'll probably be still sitting where you are. But that's about all you know, because the ceiling could collapse or something and you would all <laughs> not be in that situation. So the future is pretty difficult to pin down as well. I know this is special pleading, but I have to say this is a... I'm starting out with this project now, so a lot of the things I say this evening I think will be um, not quite right and need a better work. But uh, at the moment there is no past and there is no future. It's all in the present. The sort of mitigating circumstance of this is your human life and your memories of things that have happened in the past. Well, it's all still in the present because they're with you, but they somehow have a terrific definite colour to them because of the way you feel them. But when you die, that'll die too. So, um, the, the project is uh, somehow encompassed by this timeless no time of a thousand years, can I conceive of that as being all in the present is really the issue. Can I go back over a thousand years and understand things as though they were, as though it was all now, that I could speculate myself and speculate other people 
back into what the conditions were that made those things. That's not too difficult to understand, I think. It's quite difficult to deal with. Um, I think uh, at the moment I'm relying on this idea that architecture is made out of time and it's made out of place. And where you are is the place and the circumstances you're in are the conditions that make it. This came to me in Scotland when I, was, I went up there to investigate uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie and the rebellion. I went to Glen Finnan where he first came in and there's a monument to him, a statue. Beautiful sides of mountains, deep loch water. And I met there a geologist who was looking at something else, rather the oldest rocks in the world, the oldest known rocks in the world are those in the Outer Hebrides. And the Caledonian orogeny, the mountain building, has folded all this granite in great waves against the rock of the Outer Hebrides. Extraordinary turmoil of things being gushing out of the ground, hot and melting and cooling and turning upside down, and things getting mountains forming and then being upside down into each other and then glaciers chopping them off so there's just the tip of a mountain sticking into another mountain. All this is evident to geologists. You can see it all if you know what you're looking for. 600 million years ago. So she had this place and this time of 600 million years and I had um, 1745 relatively humdrum stuff, Glen Finnan, Battle of Culloden. And then there was a climber who was the third person. He was out there climbing these, these granite faces. And, um, you know, what climbing's like. I don't think I can do it, but I know lots of people who can. You reach up and you hold on. And you hoist yourself out by your fingertips. And his version of time and place was this rock you know, which was this far away, and the time was how many seconds he was able to hold on before having to commit himself to another move and not plunge him to his death. Apparently, with climbing, um, you get asked, now, is it skill or strength, would you say, that's the most important thing? And they say strength. No doubt about it. So, let me start these slides. I do that. Shall I just press these? Um, M for a thousand, MCMX CV1 for 1966. Now, you know that, of course, but it's just to get you used to the idea. And one of the things I noticed immediately about this is that it's not like, you know, you know the time we have, which is 1996, 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, like those stock market things where it goes, you know, 3,642, 3,600, and it's 4,000 is coming up. Can we send enough shares to break it through the 4,000 barrier? All that kind of speedometer stuff. These letters, they, get, they, they contract, they expand and contract. 1888 was the longest one I could find. But they, they go long, and then, then the turn of the century comes, and they suddenly go like that. This is... Well, that's, this is all the letters. That's 1,000, that's 500, that's 100, that's 50, that's 10, that's 5, and that's 1. And that's 1666, which was the Great Fire. And it doesn't take more than that to get me into St. Paul's. You know how I feel about St. Paul's. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of it. There's this whole um, height thing, and there's this whole blitz thing, and there's the statues which and this, if you could knock down buildings you could see it better and the height the same as the, the hills and like that but there is a problem with it too I'm using St Paul's was finished in 1712 it's going to be a bit like this this date's finished in 1712 um, and this is um, a Joseph Wright picture of people playing with an orrery and that's a statue my son John took of, a picture my son took of one of the statues in St. Paul's. It's full of statues to the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Terrific relief at having won Napoleonic Wars. Filled St. Paul's out with statues. Wait a minute, I'm getting on to St. Paul's. The problem with it, as far as M goes, of course, is um, 
it was pointed out to me, as St. Paul's isn't a, a 1700s building at all. It's a 17th century building, 1600s, because it's Baroque. And Baroque was despicable because it was Catholic, and you couldn't be a Catholic in England at that time. And so everything changed. That's why St. Paul's changed shape. On the other hand, when you go there, and um, I should say that this project is just starting out, and the deal I did with the AA was not to, to have regular enormous checks coming in while I wandered about the country <laughs> doing this research, but was to go, I have to go to these places to photograph them, draw them, speculate about them, and that other people would come with me. So there are a series of, vi series of visits to these buildings. When you go to St. Paul's, you, don't, you go around it rather than through the nave. You go to all these secret spaces. These are the bits above the nave, which I'm sure I've talked about before. This is, a, this is the funny cantilevered staircase. You can see it just sticks out of the wall like that, stones. And this thing is very tall, sort of 60 feet tall. And the little cracks in the stones where the stress is beginning to show. And the guy who takes you up there says, OK, you got, wait, 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 wait. Let him get 20 feet away. OK, you keep to the edge of the wall like this. And it's, you go up the outside, this very tall thing. And the vertigo starts there, and it doesn't leave you until, until you come out into the staircase again. Um, these are two of the Napoleonic things. This is Wellington's tomb in St. Paul's. That's Nelson's tomb. That's under the transept. If you look through the grate, you can see the top of it and there's almost all of Nelson's bones in there because he lost this one. He lost one of his arms at sea. And that's Wellington's grand tomb. Now, also somewhere, on a plaque in St. Paul's like this, uh, is a, a list of the deans of the cathedral, and they go back to 900 and something. This is the sort of fact I can't quite remember. And there are only 100 or so of these guys up there. Only 100 people to go all that way. And I thought about this a bit more and realized that if, if you had somebody of 85 and they were telling somebody of five all about everything that had happened in their life, and then if this person of five grew up to become an old person of 85 and told another little five-year-old about everything that had happened in their life, that it would only take 12 lives to go all the way back to the year M, 1000, that somebody born in 1000, the 12th life on, would be 85 in 1960-something. Now that almost, almost shelves the 10 buildings project and turns it into a 10 and 12 people project, I think. But I'm waiting to see how that turns out. The first person in um, 10,000 would have been 85 when this building was built. It's the White Tower in the Tower of London. And uh, the peculiarity about this building, here's a, it's one of the network of um, forts the Normans built to occupy the country, which they did, well, successfully, but they had to keep it wrapped down for two or three hundred years until the people start wriggling. And uh, it's a big square keep like this. You have to go in upstairs. And those three windows there are the windows of a, a, a cathedral, a Norman cathedral, like... It reminds me of Durham. There it is on the right. That's, it's called St. John's Chapel. And this cutaway is from the guidebook. It's not a very nice drawing, but it's got this quality that this thing has of being stuck in there, up there. Reminds me to say that uh, the, the thing about... Um, uh, the Tower of London, and why you don't get there is it's full of tourists. It's very expensive to get in, and it's all tourists. Even when you've got tourists staying with you who go to see it, they come back saying, too many tourists, didn't go in. And uh, this, these visits are not, they're not tourist excursions. They're research trips. Now, here's, here are the princes in the tower. This is what the tower's famous for. That's Delaroche, who was a, an old-fashioned history painter of the um, 19th century. This is Millet's. Paintings done almost exactly the same time, and pretty similar, really, I think. And they're in there, they're to do with the tower, but they remind me that uh, there's a sort of out-of-date way of studying history which has kings and queens in it, the dates of the kings and queens in it. This is not something that's taught at school. 
but the, there is something about the dates. So they're, they're, the reigns are all different lengths, you know. There's an average of about 20 years, but some of them are only five and some of them are 60. And these dates of the kings and queens clocking in through these thousand years, uh, they provide a sort of armature, you know. An armature is the thing which is inside the statue. The, you make a, a wire frame and then you pack clay around it, and this wire frame is the armature. And uh, dates are like coordinates, they're like space coordinates. In, in looking at history like this, could be very useful. Uh, out of date, but very useful. Uh, the biggest, most uh, virulent time of kings and queens thing in England was the Wars of the Roses. This is the building that stands for the 1400s. This character here is uh, the Duke of Warwick. And the little one sitting on his palm is Henry VI. He was guardian to Henry VI. And he's holding um, a model of a chapel because he built, he had built for himself, he specified it in his will that he should have this chantry chapel built. And he died in France somewhere and he was brought back to the chapel and he was laid outside the church in Warwick for 27 years until it was built. That's the church. This is the thing that was built on the, the extension that was built in 1440-something. And this is the doorway, down a few steps, and that's one of the later ancestors lying on a sarcophagus inside the thing. It is an extraordinary building, very detailed, and they all had them. This was the uh, forerunner of the next Duke of Warwick, who was Warwick the Kingmaker in the Wars of the Roses, changed sides, got killed, lost everything. But there's a, a chantry chapel in this perpendicular Gothic, which is all upright, like a, a um, you know, s uh, platoon of soldiers. And they had Edward IV, who was the enemy, has one at um, Windsor. And this is the big famous one. This is Henry VII's Chantry Chapel, which is added on to the edge of uh, Westminster <coughs> Cathedral. Uh, this slide really could be um, much bigger, or maybe the visit would sh show what it was really like, because the, the roof is the thing that uh, your attention is drawn to. This one here has, you see, you see the stained glass window at the end of the three panels in it. On the center panel, towards the top, those colored bits are angels. And they're holding a musical script, which is part of the Annunciation Mass. And the chantry chapels were used to say, to sing prayers for these dead people in perpetuity. They die, these prayers are said forever. That's the point of them, and I think that's why they're so intense. This one of... Um, Henry the Seventh. It's too late to fit in the 1400s. It's contemporary with the High Renaissance. It was built in the first ten years of the 1500s, so it's contemporary with that little round Bramante Chapel. And yet it's Gothic. It's inescapably old-fashioned and at a dead end. But it has an extreme delicacy in the roof up there. You see, right up here. Um, there are pendants hanging down from the ceiling. I really don't know how good this slide is for you to see this. These pendants hanging down from the ceiling. The structure of the thing is really these arched ribs that go across, and the pendants are, you know how a, an arch has shaped bits, shaped stones to go into it. And the pendants are cut, elongations of these things. And they have a little ledge around here, and the fans are resting on these elongations, and they're going out like that to form another section of roof. And um, <coughs> it is uh, Bob Evans's observation, who was uh, a terrific speculative historian who would get to the point where there was no proof and then he would speculate, which I think is the grand ambition for history now. Um, and his speculation was that it was all done, it was all pre-cut and assembled into place. It's immensely complicated, but that it is all pre-cut. It's not carved on site. And that really, you could call this out of date because it's Gothic and there was all that stuff going on in Italy, but this is so advanced, this stone-cutting technique, 
that it wasn't really picked up for another couple of hundred years in France. The sophisticated projections required to be able to cut these stones, and more than that, it wasn't really uh, used until the first complicated machines started being made where difficult things had to fit together. So this is really way ahead of its time. It's like you know, very advanced technology. I did have time to reflect that it was, it reminded me anyway of the internet as a, as a technology, which is invented for fighting wars, and then uh, this is much more useful than wars, and, but what for? And maybe 300 years will produce the answer to that one too. Now, um, that was too late to go in the 1400s section, but it didn't matter because what was 1500s in England is just as interesting, really. And it's the Reformation. It's the separation of the Church of England from the Roman Church. And the process didn't go quietly, mostly because the Jesuits invented themselves to fight back against the Protestants. The Counter-Reformation is, sort of, is, is an understanding that the Catholic Church couldn't just let this happen, but would have to reform itself and start arguing strongly the opposite case. Uh, the Jesuits invented um, tutorial teaching, for instance, instead of standing here lecturing people. It was one-to-one -one explaining, rationalizing. They had a, a deep system of uh, spiritual exercises where you imagined, kneel on the ground, imagine Christ walking to the cross, imagine what it feels like for his feet. All this, it's all written down, interesting stuff. Uh, but they were a fifth column. They were in England illegally. If they were caught, then this is what was done to them. So naturally they tried to hide as much as they could. This is a priest hole at Oxborough Hall. That's the building by Thomas Tresham at Liveden. Now, Tresham... Uh, yeah, these are other pictures of it. Tresham was a recusant Catholic. He wouldn't give in. He wouldn't say that the Queen had power over the Pope. And for this he was put in jail and he was fined. Although he was a, a full of this um, interesting 15th century device architecture, he could have built Hardwick Hall or Woolerton, but he didn't have the money to do it because he was being fined all the time. In the, instead he built these little, little tiny buildings. This one's in the shape of a cross. All these buildings are sort of meditations on his um, religion. Um, these ones are... The one on the left, I guess, is the most famous, which is the Trinity. This is a three-sided thing. Everything is threes. It's sort of 33 feet long, and it's got three stories to it, and each gable has... Each side has three gables. It was built in 1593. He didn't use the M system, and I wondered why it wasn't... Um, MD um, XC 111. But then 9 and 3 make 12, and 5 and 1 make 6, and th this was how his mind went. Uh, he, he, the thing inside here, th this is such a complex roof in such a tiny building, which is maybe um, half the size of this room. And there's a, there's a a staircase in one corner and a fireplace in the other corner and the chimney for the fireplace has to be got across to come out in the centre with all the structure of these gables flying about and you s it's done in stone and the, s the chimney is taken up in stone and then across the roof like that and out and it's cradled in all this roof structure and it, it really did remind me of one of those priests in one of those tiny little holes and uh, that, that's the thing he did before the trouble really hit, which is a, a little building in Rothwell, a sort of market building. These are the, the um, around the frieze of the coats of arms of his friends. So those three buildings make a little strange set. They're all sort of within 10 miles of each other. And they stand for 1500s. Now, this is a slight change of subject. But it's, um, it's really the, this old question that's been mooted quite often is whether you could write a field guide for architecture. And one says, no, forget it. Field guide is natural history. 
You know, there is a natural, a natural history means a history which is written without time. It's knowledge of stories about the natural world, and there is an implication that there's no time in it, in the dictionary this is. Of course, there is a time, because everything is evolving, and things are dropping off the list. It's just that you can't see it. And the field guide, the field guide is taken at a sort of static point. When it comes to machines, you have to be very precise. This is 1989 Observer's Book. And the Observer's Books are, uh, well, they, all they do is they give you this picture and this information, and it's strictly comparative. You turn the page, and you get another pair, and you turn the page, and you get another pair. These two planes are immensely similar and immensely different from each other, and it's, a, it's an interesting format. Like that. Similar but different. Or like this. This is those are observers' books, which are very, very uh, down, down at the bottom of the heap. These are field guides, which are slightly more erudite. This is from the land snails of Britain and Northwest Europe. That's from the eggs, nests, and nestlings of British and European birds. Those are little skewers and orcs. And there are page after page of these things. This one here is a kingfisher. That's the cuckoo. Special little illustrations show how the cuckoo works. The cuckoo's laid in the nest and hatches out before the little birds of the host. So they're still eggs. And it's got an, a, a reaction that when an egg touches the small of its back, it flips like that. And it goes on doing it until it gets rid of the annoyance, and it goes out of the nest. And then it gets bigger, and another egg hits its back, and it does the same with that as well. Until it's all alone in the nest. That's what a cuckoo in the nest does. It takes it over. And it's a bit like the artistic impulse, you know, that you, 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 get, a, you get a thing that you have to do, and so you start doing it. And, and every time you do it, and you do it and you finish and it goes out in the nest. That's what I feel like at the moment. Landscape, out of the nest. Buildings, M, now. But the problem with architecture as being a field guide is that um, every building is different from every other. There is an attempt to make them typologically similar, but really they're all different. They've all got a postcode, you know, so you don't need a field guide so much as a gazetteer, which is a slightly different thing. I want to be able to do it, though, and, and, and this is another one of my ambitions for this project. I think it's most likely to occur with this lot here. These are the 19th century buildings. Well, it started out with the Eddystone, which is the one on the right. They're the rock towers that were built in the 1880s by Scottish engineers. These two are built by James Douglas. This is Bishop Rock here, which is right on the tip of the Isles of Scilly, and that's Eddystone, which is... Uh, 22 miles outside Plymouth. Eddystone was always a very important one because the rocks are in such a tricky place and Plymouth is such an important port. Uh, the, the person who owned this rock, which is 22 miles out the sea, how does he own it, built the first lighthouse in the 1700s and used to have dinner parties there and go fishing and have cranes and stuff. And it came down in a storm in... 1703, and he died in it. But uh, <coughs> these are, there's a section, and a, this is an attempt to make one of those panoramas out of the lighthouse. This is the one on Paul and Bill. I haven't got to Eddystone yet, but there are, there are two technologies. One is the interlocking blocks of granite, and one is Fresnel's work on lenses which makes it possible for them to be efficient. Here's a map of the British Isles showing these little things here are light beacons. And they go all the way around. And this was done, well, it says by 1875. And this is like, well, it's for me, it's the, it's the, the first complete successful act of nationalization in this country. And when I was reading about it, I discovered that enormous sums of money changed hands in order to be able to complete this thing. You know, people would own bits of rock and they would just, just hold out for more money and it had to be done because lives were going to be lost. 
The money was returned in uh, dues which uh, ship owners pay as they come up here. Um, Eddystone is this one here. This is a closer up bit off the Admiralty chart. There's Eddystone. There's Bishop Rock. And uh, huge sums of money changed hands in this nationalization. And I was just thinking how interesting it is that you get rich going into a nationalization and then you get rich coming back out of it. These stone towers have been automated and they've had helicopter pads put on top of them. That's the one on the Isle of Wight. And those are the a new range of gas of um, lighthouses, which are, that's the North Sea gas field off the coast of Norfolk. Here are two um, Victorian children. Victoria Stanley's portrait by uh, Sergeant unknown match boy. Uh, it's pretty obvious why I should put those there, but in looking at this thousand years, one of the things that's come to me is there are two big break points in English history, and one of them is this immediately post Wars of the Roses, start of the 1500s, where things were centralized and sorted out properly for the first time, so that there wasn't a load of robber barons like the norms had been all going. It took that long. The other one is this period, the 19th century, and this inequality has something to do with the population. When I start this project in the year M, the population of England is about 2 million, just over. And it gradually grows and gradually grows until it's reached about 8 million uh, at the start of the 18th century. It's quadrupled from the year naught to the year 1800. Between 1800 and 1900, it quadrupled again. So there were 32 million people by 1900. This is the Ely Cathedral. Now I'm on the 1300s, 14th century. These are two pictures taken from the same spot. You know how it is. You take a picture and then the cloud goes and you get a completely different picture. Now, the cathedrals are the other difficult thing about the project because they, they, were t they took so long to build, two or three hundred years. So they span the centuries and they, they mess up the ten buildings schema. But this one's here because the, uh, the lantern in the middle was built in 1327. And I'm sure I've spoken to every single person in this room about it before, but this is the one where these huge, eight huge timbers were... Um, looked for. They, they had to be 80 feet high and they had to be dead straight and they had to be this big. And you don't just go out and find trees or anywhere like that. You have to go and look for them, even then. Because there's something about this time of the 1300s when the forest must have been noticeably disappearing. The Robin Hood legend is all about forest and it's just before this. By 1600 all the forest had gone, uh, which is why they started using uh, coke to smelt the iron when it first happened. And somewhere in that three or four hundred years, the forest must have been visibly just going. Rather like the open country is perceived as disappearing under the roads. I think it must have felt similar to that. And I want to know what the difference is between building these big wooden structures at the point that that was happening. That's a picture of stained glass. These are two stained glass windows in the Lady Chapel. It's been very heavily restored and under sponsorship. And so instead of pictures of Jesus Christ, there are these windows. It's incredible. This is money in the temple. Money lenders in the temple. Um, but who should have thought that Tesco's coat of arms would be a badger? <laughs> Isn't that terrific? This is the King Richard II time. Those are the angels. Um, I put him in because he built Westminster Hall, which is another one of these big timber roofs, which is more or less contemporary with the lantern at, at Ely. But just too late. It was finished in 1401, so it can't be part of the 1300s thing. This is a picture by Canaletto of it. That's Westminster Hall, painted in 1750 or so. I like this because that's Westminster Hall where the government sat. That's Westminster Abbey, where the church was. 
and this is the first bit of the new palace where the king was. And that's how England was for a long, long time, I guess until 1714. Oh, yeah, the one before was. Oh, I cannot find this again. There's one of the problems Ely has, which is an interesting thing, is that this tower is missing. That one's been done up, that's why it looks like this. But there used to be another one here which fell down. And on flipping through Bannister Fletcher, which is the handbook for comparative historians, I discovered there are quite a lot like this. This is Strasbourg, and that's Chartres. It hasn't fallen down, but somebody's obviously done something, so somebody could do something to that. So there is a project somewhere in the M project to, to redo the, the last Tower of Ely. I'm going back now. I said that there's a break point at um, 1500, and Ely was 1300s. This is the 1200s. This is Carrick Kennan Castle in Wales. But this is not England, but it is the border of England that was trying to be established by Edward I. <laughs> And this is one of the castles that sit on the border of this warlike tribe of Welsh. And it's spectacularly sited. It really is a beautiful site. And it's built out of the rocks that it stands on. And they're, they're limestone rocks. Underneath this thing, there's a, there's a cave in the limestone rock, which has to have its own little special fortification just to make sure that people don't get into the cave and then tunnel through into the castle. And it has this extraordinary tortured quality about it. Beautiful place to go to. Um, they, they're cru it's, I think those black and white ones make it look like the Crusader castles. If we were to go back another century for the, that was 1200s, to the 1100s bit, these, this is the Temple Church, which was built in 1185 which is four years before Richard I came to the throne. Now, the Templars were a, a group of Crusader knights who got together to police and escort Crusades to the Holy Land. This is Jerusalem. It's the only picture I had of it. What I want are pictures of the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem, which was built over the spot where Christ came to life again. And it was, the, it was the focus of the Crusades, was to get hold of this spot and get it back for Christendom. And there was a temple built around it, a round Roman temple, which the Templars got to and rebuilt. And when they came, in England, they founded themselves their own churches, being a holy order, a fighting holy order, were round in imitation of the Holy Sepulchre. There are a few others as well in that set. It, they, they lie on the floor. These, these are pictures from before the war. There's the round church. You see these things on the floor here? These are, these are um, funeral effigies of crusader knights who are now in this condition, which you would think was the passage of time, but in fact it's the collapse of the roof in the Blitz, crashed down and smashed them all to pieces in 1940. Luckily, somebody had taken plaster casts, and they're in the Victorian Albert Cast Museum in 1932. That is an extraordinary place to go to, that cast museum. That's the rotunda that was built after the war. This is the restoration, sort of clumsy 50s restoration. That's a picture of an, another Crusader castle. It appears in, in a Sassetta drawing in the National Gallery. And it, it's, it's, some, it's some sort of dream of St. Francis, who was a soldier in the Crusades before he became a monk. He's in the bottom corner. And this is somehow, I guess, it's in the future for him. He's off to war. That's why it's like that. It's in the future. There's no concept of space. And so how do you do that? How do you do the underneath of a castle? How do you paint the underneath of a castle? Um, I put Jupiter and Neptune up here to try and get me out of this chauvinistic um, 
cycle of England. Uh, just to say that this project, because it's at the beginning, a lot of these things are speculations, but it's not that, this, it's not that I'm trying to get away from the speculations. And that um, I've said the other thing. This is the first visit. This is the visit we're going to do on um, Feb the 16th, Friday, Feb the 16th. It's a trip to Bolsover Castle. This stands for the 1600s. Cavendish is the man who brought dressage to England. That's a Viennese bit of dressage going on there. And in the background is this um, place he built for his horses, stables. The stable is, is there. The floor is like moleskin. It's not moleskin cloth, but like moles killed and skinned and sewn together. It's sort of brown, soft. As part of this chivalric exercise, there was a castle built. I think it must have been to have parties in. Uh, you see, there's a big crack in the wall there because it's built on top of a, a coal mine, um, which has made the ground subside. So it's this, it's this strange wrecked ruin, which in the castle bit has these fabulous Jacobean rooms in it, Carolingian rooms in it. And the castle is a, a strange place which is on a sort of half level, which is all right. And you go from one room to another to get round the place, but they're not in a procession. You have to go round the corners of the square. But then there are three staircases in it also. So you can go <coughs> through this building from one place to another in all sorts of different routes. And that's why I think it was for having parties in. Now, he... He, this was all built, it started being built in 1608 and went on until the Civil War and then it stopped. And they all went and languished in France and then they came back and he carried on the building. He rented it for a thousand years in 1608 from his cousin. The, the hardest thing about this project is the 20th century. And... Um, just because there's so much building and there, there is so much of a question about how to do that. I don't know whether these two people show what the 20th century was enough. There's a lot of fighting and a lot of movies in it. Um, it makes me wonder... There's a slightly downbeat part of it that the, the Boer War really finished England off. The rest of it has just been hanging on, enduring. That whole thing about going to Antarctica, Scott, endurance was what was being tested out there. And it has more or less gone on like that ever since. 20th century, I think, has been an American century. And so there's a slightly downbeat end to what 20th century architecture in England could conceivably be. What, what, if you were going to have one building, what would it be? And uh, my holding position at the moment is this thing down in Dungeness, which you know about. It's the listening post. This is the Battle of Britain. Bombers come over, and these things were sent up to be oral posts, actually listening, not like radar, but actual sound waves. And, of course, very quickly uh, discovered to be uh, useless compared to radar. But they're machines, really. They're, they're buildings which are machines, which is a preoccupation of mine because so many people try and do it. And buildings and machines are different. Machines rust and they get obsolete and you know that and you chuck them away and you start again. The buildings have a different way of becoming obsolete. They sort of fall into ruin and then they become these extraordinary things. I think these things are like the pyramids. It's another picture of them. Especially that big one at the back. This is the one which has a big curve about 100 yards across. It's a big curve like that, but it's part of a sphere, this thing, so it curves like that as well, section of a sphere. And it just does nothing. It's precisely built down to the last centimetre in concrete. And it's useless, but it's beautiful. This is um, on the same site, on the same part of the world, and 
It stands for some other possibilities. And the background is a real machine building. That's the Dungeness Nuclear Power Station, which kind of hums all the time. And this thing is Derek Jarman's garden, which was built with enormous courage in the face of imminent death on this useless place. Now, I've given my watch away, so I don't know what time it is. But we're on the last run. Thank you. Um, I didn't have a spare picture of the Tower of London, but I did have this. You can see Tower Bridge right in the corner there. And the trees are the trees of the park which are attached to the tower. This is part of a panoramic set of the bridges of London, and it happens that you can easily get down onto the beach. This is underneath that bridge. And Tower Bridge has disappeared altogether. But you can see Canary Wharf. So there was the temple, that's 1100. So there was this Crusader's Castle in Wales, Wales, the 1200. There's the Ely Lantern for 1300. There's the Beecham uh, Chantry Chapel for the 1400s. Uh, this is 1500s. Yeah, this is about the recusants. You know the, the legend of the... Um, legend that, that if the ravens leave the Tower of London, England shall fall. You know that one? It says here, food, very varied, dead animals of all sorts. And the Tower of London is where people used to be beheaded and their heads stuck up on the, on the thing. So naturally it was surrounded by carry, birds of carrion. And if you stop doing that, if you stop beheading your enemies, the nation will fall. I think that's what I mean. That's the big horse, the horse door at Bolsover where you can ride into the stables. 1600s. St. Paul's, 1700s. 1800s. And, well, the, this is an observation about the 20th century anyway. This is another one of John's pictures of the Lloyd's building, which is magnificent. But look how it's admired in the processes of the city. One of, the, one of the things I'm concerned about is this uh, listing of significant buildings. Um, you know, this is the first building that was a canteen attached to a factory in England, so it should be safe. Uh, or this was the earliest building by Dennis Lansden, so it should be safe. And it, the, the point of listing is to say things which are good, which are about to be knocked down. It's not to go around plotting significant things and making a sort of chronicle of importances. That's what historians do. And if you, if you remanufacture your past in such a way by allotting significance to things, you end up with this, which I don't think anyone would complain about having one of those. I think that's a beautiful picture. Uh, and it is American. It is 20th century. Uh, it's not England, but it's England is on its way to becoming like that. And um, I, w I have been thinking for the last couple of days on how, how, I, how I get out of this bind in this project of the thousand years in England and ending up with the 20th century being almost over and I'm not sure that anything has happened yet. I shouldn't say this with so many architects in the room, I guess, because it may be that I could be wrong and that your buildings are the ones, but it needs more thinking about, let me put it that way. I think it may mean abandoning England. One of the things that I've been thinking about in spacing these things around is, is to come to grips with the regional nature of it and the, uh, the quality of the union with Scotland and Wales and the possibilities, which is an American possibility of federalizing with Europe. Not, not as nation states federalizing with each other, but breaking the nations apart until their regions federalized as though they were states. So London would be an independent state federated with the rest of it, and Scotland would be something else. 
the 5 million people in Scotland, 3 million people in Wales, 7 million people in London. These are about the size of American states. America's got nearly 300 million people in it. Europe's got 350 million or something. So you could construct a representative body which was made up of regions. So there's a possibility. And that's really the M project. The idea is that uh, these visits set off at roughly monthly intervals. And they're advertised in the events list. And in order to be able to have some clue about what size the bus should be, um, it's, it's, it's required, really, that everybody comes forward and says what, whether they want to come on one of these visits or not. Um, and the coordinator is Yante Kalasports, who uh, is in the membership office downstairs. Yante is spelled I-A-N-T-H-E. Okay, thanks. That's it. <laughs> now, it is... Uh, it is customary to invite questions on these occasions. I must say that for the last 20 years, I've been going to them and nobody's ever asked any. Um, so I'm never prepared to ask, answer questions. But this is different because this is the start of a new project. And I need to know what happens to it. So if anybody has any observations of a penetrating nature, I'd like to hear them. You may not get much of an answer, but I, you know. I'd like to hear them. Or else uh, this is true to form and we're going to go up to the bar and discuss these things. Well, no anti-federalists here anyway. <laughs> okay, cheers. No. Do ask questions. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> it doesn't count if you ask one. It doesn't count by No. I just don't want to go thinking that things are. Oh, God. No, not a proper question. The building I did with Tresham's Rushton buildings, the three yeah, Rushton buildings. Yes, they are. These are. Um, yeah, this is a question about the those three buildings which Thomas uh, Tresham did. The guy who w refused to give up his Catholicism and had to build these little things. And there are three of them. They're like those little um, gold, silver, and lead caskets in the speech by um, when in the Merchant of Venice. You know, where the lead one has Portia in it? You know that one? And um, Liveden is, is the latest one. And it has on it these uh, lozenges in mm. stone, which are hatchments. They're the same shape as the hatchments you see in churches. When somebody dies, you paint their coat of arms, surrounded by ba black, and then you hang it up by one of its corners, so it's crooked. Why? Well, it's a sort of um, observation that somebody's passed on. Okay. But if you look at the San Redan pictures of churches in Holland, it's a Protestant... No, it can't be a Protestant church. Anyway, they're very noticeable there because they're white churches and they've got these black hatchments. Okay. And I think he was preparing them right. for after the revolution, when the country had become Catholic and he could carve up the arms of the martyrs. Okay. I they're blank, yes. Because the building was, I think the building was supposed to, I don't know that this is true, it's my speculation, but the building was, it was set up and he would eventually come into his own. His son was involved in the gunpowder plot and the Jesuit priests were all hiding in the holes and taking things very carefully because of this hanging, drawing and quartering. And the young bloods who did the gunpowder plot used to have little files of gunpowder which they wore as necklaces and strut around them. So it's no wonder they were caught. <laughs> but that, that didn't enter Tresham's estate. Was he um, uh, executed? 
No, I think he was allowed to die in peace because he wasn't actually implicated in the plot. Irene? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a, I look at it as a sort of um, easy way to explain it to publishers, you know. Um, you've got to put things very straight and very clear. One building for 10,000 years, developed by 1,000 years, one building for each century. It sort of works. But I agree, it's in the, you know, in the, the arbitrary nature of the time is interesting. The arbitrary nature of the nat national boundary is interesting. If you can dissolve one and federalize it, it may be the sum equivalent of federalizing time, too. But I, I, I have no idea what you might discover. This would be interesting to continue that conversation. I think you said you were interested in the cement which holds these ten buildings together. <laughs> so that might be a place to start. I want to know what he told Andrew Saint um, at dinner. Well, I could. It's eight by four dining table. One didn't have to pursue conversations, because <laughs> you couldn't hear any of What was that? Oh, no, forget it, another time. <laughs> but he was very, uh, I think he must have been working, perhaps, perhaps that's what he was talking to MIT about. I don't know. You know, so this no will space, be made clear. No space before 19th century. I think he said the 19th century, yeah. He may have said the 18th. <laughs> it's true, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but how did you get anything built? Because, you know, the thing you put down would occupy the space of this one. You might think, oh, well, you know, which stone could go where? <coughs> Do you have question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Hmm? Very full of buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. I'm worried about that. Because the buildings are not really very amusing, are they? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there must be a way to find that too. I don't. It's part of. You see, the, with this landscapes, buildings, and machines things, I've just finished the landscape book, and that's gone off. That's coming out in this time next year. And so, buildings. I need to turn my attention to them because I'm not quite ready to do machines yet. I've got an idea for it, but it's still a fledgling. Well, it sounds as if Dungeness is playing a big part somewhere. It'll bring the landscapes and the buildings. Yes, Dungeness is pretty good from that point of view, it's true. But the machines, because they, they go all over the place, and uh, they're so um, meshed up with our um, contemporary uh, interchangeable politics, you know, you can have machines for dealing with people. Um, I, I think there may be there may be some story in there. Thank you. Okay, thank Just you. Thank you very much. <laughs>